and the musicians. We are so blessed to have her. She came to us from Lee College, and I'm sure she'll give you some of her testimony. But um, it has really been an asset for us, the love that she brings in to the music department and to the church here. So would y'all please welcome Judy Morgan. Thank you, thank you. We wouldn't know what to do in our music department without Brenda, I'll tell you. Because music people are flaky, and we all know that. Are we? But the Lord uses us, right? In spite. He doesn't make... Uh, I enjoyed Lindell so much yesterday morning, I've never heard him do better. And he really laid it all out on the line, just like it really is and about David playing out there to the animals with his harp and being a little different. Well, that's all right, because wouldn't it be boring world if all of you ladies had on black dresses and red coats today? It would just, then we would look like we were on fire, like Brother Ward Simpson just said. All you guys came in with khaki pants and uh, white t-shirt, you know, it'd just be like, well, whose uniform are y'all wearing today, you know? But God made us individually, and he made us to be individuals. And uh, he gave us all talents, and he gave us all different talents. And I'm glad the Lord brought me to this music department. I did not apply for this job. God just did it, and I am so thankful. Every day I'm thankful. It's like I I can hardly believe it. I've got some choir members scattered here and some music team, and i got a sister and brother-in-law and a bunch of people from North Georgia over there. So if you see somebody that's younger and prettier but still looks kind of like me, it's my sister. <laughs> um, okay. I want to talk to you out of my heart. Um, I need to qualify this title because this title is Pregnant with a Promise. And this is not a women's conference. But you men are pregnant also. You just don't think about it, maybe. Or maybe you do. And uh, the Lord spoke to me back the first part of March, early in the morning or late in the night. I don't, I don't know what time it was. I know that it was so pointed that finally I got up and I started um, writing down what he told me. And then when I went back after these, uh, see, see what I help? Thanks, Brenda. When I uh, went back and got more serious about, well, what am I going to say at this meeting? That can't tie in with worship. And after I started reading what I wrote down, I thought, hmm, I didn't write that. It must have been the Lord because I don't even talk like that. And I got to reading the scripture and I thought, oh, all they're doing is worshiping. So it does tie in together. Before I can do that, though, I have to tell you something that helped me to get to the place I am today. It was not my education. It was not my daddy's calling or my grandpa's. I came from a line of preachers saved by grace. But it was this. And I want to tell you, if you're a worship leader, if you're a pastor, like some people that have slipped in here, or if you're a singer, or you're an intercessor, or if you just try, you're trying to find what God wants you to do, you cannot make it in this life without this in a real healthy relationship with this. I'm telling you the truth. I, I could give you a list of things, not troubles and woes, but a list of victories. And I shared some of that last year. Some of you that were here last year have even commented to me about that. But, you know, it's so wonderful when we read our word, God's word consistently because we're supposed to. It's like sometimes like eating spinach that you don't like. You just do it because you know you're supposed to do it. it. Helps keep everything working. And this helps keep everything working. And then there are times when it just kicks in and you just don't want to put it down. And that's wonderful. And then there are times when 
what is called a rhema word just jumps out at you. And you say, oh my goodness, why didn't I see that the other times I've read this? I'm reading this to you. This is NIV, but um, Psalm 119, verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. And I, I firmly believe you cannot take a little devotional, a little tiny devotional, and I'm all for everybody that wants to, to have a loaf of uh, manna on your table. You know what I'm talking about? The old-timey little loaf of bread that's got a scripture. You can pull a scripture a day. But um, you can look at me until I got a healthy appetite. And I, I can't live on a slice of bread a day. I don't want to. <laughs> and I hope that if I'm around you, you can tell that I've got a healthy appetite for this because this is what carries you through the storms. And it has to be hidden in your heart. It can't be a scripture that you memorized uh, when you were in uh, the six-year-old Sunday school class. That's good, and those will come back to you. But you need a daily walk with God's word on your own. I'm telling you, if you eat every day, you need to read God's word every day. If you eat more than once a day, I'm just going to let you finish that thought. Uh, let me read this again because it's so important for me to tell you this is my testimony right here. If your law had not been my delight, you know what delight means, I would have perished in my affliction. Uh, delight means joy, bliss, gladness, pleasure, ecstasy, happiness, rapture. And antonym for that means revolt, sorrow, annoyance, displeasure, disgust, to displease, to be revulsive, to be in misery. And I know some Christians that act like that they got the flip side of the delight thing. I don't know any in Pensacola. <laughs> But I, I've met one or two in my life that call themselves a Christian, and uh, they didn't delight themselves in the Lord. It was disgust. I've got to go to church again tonight. I mean, sister so-and-so sick, she expects me to go over there and visit her. The food committee is calling for food. They think I got time to fix a dish. You know what I'm talking about. Have y'all seen anybody like that? And they dare call themselves a child of God? We're supposed to be so happy with the Lord that we delight ourselves in him. That means that we want to be there. We want to be doing what he wants us to do. We want to please him. It's not a have-to thing. It's just that we want to. We want to read his word because we know that we have nourishment there. We want to pray because then we can pour our heart out to him. And if we'll get still and stay long enough, he'll pour his heart back out to us. And that's the part that we miss sometimes also. Psalm 37 and 4 has uh, quite a number of commandments in it. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. The, ver the fourth verse says, Delight yourselves in the Lord, and what will he do? The desires of your heart. Okay, now think about it. Is it the desire for a new car? Is it the desire to remodel your house? Is it the desire to get the latest thing from Parisian down here at the mall? No, those are not godly desires. They're not evil desires, but that's not the kind of desires God's going to give us. If we delight ourselves in Him, then even our desires are going to be what He wants them to be. He's going to do things like save our children and heal us when we're sick, and give us peace when we're troubled, okay? All of those good things, the things that really last, the things that are important. I don't have time. If I had all day and tonight and tomorrow and the next night and even took t Tommy Tenney's place Friday, I couldn't tell you all the things he's done for me. But I just love him. I just love to be in his presence. He's so good. Say it with me. He is good. All the time. That's right. All the time. Okay, now let's get to this thing about being pregnant. 
We're going to spend most of our time in the first chapter of Luke. And I'm going to give you guys a scripture because you're probably saying I should have slipped over to the, somebody else's part here. Everybody has a promise. And the Lord just brought it very vividly to my attention about Mary's situation and then Elizabeth's situation and how difficult it was to get this promise fulfilled. We all know that, that Mary's promise was carrying Jesus. But we also know that uh, there are other promises that are important in your life, things that God told you. I was so touched uh, when Pastor Kilpatrick the other night spoke and he prophesied and said some of you were in certain places with God as a child and now you're waiting for that to happen again. And it's going to happen again. And that's a promise. That's a promise you can count on. Uh, Paul, who was a short man, I like short people because, you know, I, you can hardly see me, I know. Uh, Paul was a macho man. He was a man's man because he stood through all the persecution that came to him for the Lord. And toward the end of his life, if you will just make a note of Acts 27, you can read this whole story. Paul was going to be shipwrecked. But he was on his way to be tried, to be killed, actually. And uh, I just want to throw this in, just so you guys won't feel really left out when we get talking about being pregnant and all that stuff. Paul was about to be shipwrecked, and he had a promise from God, an angel of God. And he said, an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood by me and said, Fear not, you will be brought to Caesar and all that are with you. Just hang on to the planks of the ship or something. Stay with the ship. Just stay. Just, you know, it's going to be trouble. They're throwing out the cargo. They're throwing out the food. They would fasted like a couple weeks. The storm was dark. But see, he told them. He told them before they got there, so it's going to be bad. This is not the right decision, but they did it anyway. And sometimes you're not in control of things that happen to you. But if God gives you a promise then you can count on it. You're going to make it. And if uh, you feel like you're about to die, but God told you so-and-so, if God really said that, you're not going to die yet. You know, you're going to get to the promise because he said. We can't be foolish, you know, and just, just take anything as his word. But anyway, all right. Let's look at Luke, first chapter. I'm going to talk to you about Mary's situation. When you think about Mary, you think she's righteous, she's a virgin, she was espoused. You can kind of follow this in the scripture. These are the things it says. She was of the house of David. She was highly favored. The angel came to her and told her that. Scared her to death. But he said, you're highly favored. The Lord's with you. You're blessed among women. And then the next thing that the scripture says is that she was troubled. And she was amazed. She questioned, how can this be? She was afraid. She thought, I have, and she told the angel, I haven't even been with a man. I'm a virgin. How can this be? But at that point, all of that was gone. It was all past. Just think from the standpoint of a young, not just a young girl, a young righteous girl. We value our reputation, right? I was taught as a child, your name is better than silver and gold. And once you mess up your name, you're going to have a long time ever getting it back. And that is true. And I'm sure that she thought, what, what is going to happen to me? Everybody will know. You know, this is not something that can be hidden over two or three months. Everybody's going to know she was engaged, but she had not been like a lot of girls that are that are engaged. Uh, but I just want us to observe the things that she said and the things that uh, she did. Let me get the scripture right here because I just want to give it to you right out of God's word. The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the high, Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. 
Now he tells her another secret. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. The one who they say is barren. In her, she's in her six months. She's six months pregnant right now. And this is one of our favorite scriptures. Luke 1, 37, For nothing is impossible with God. For with God nothing is impossible. And what did Mary say in verse 38? NIV says, I'm the Lord's servant. She answered, may it be to me as you have said. And the angel left her. Mike, have you got a King James over there? Anybody? Who's got a good, strong voice in a King James? Lori? Uh, will you stand and read verse 38 of the King James? Thank you. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Now just think about all this information just given into her head to process. You're going to be pregnant. Da, 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 and just, you know, well, that would be enough to make me faint. You know, if I was that young and, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, this is not the Lord. This can't be the Lord. The Lord doesn't do stuff like this. The Lord doesn't call shame, does he? Depends on your promise. This was a promise. And I read in one place that every Jewish girl was praying for this. I don't believe that. I, I'm sorry if that messes up something that you believe, but you know, there had been 400 dark years. And I just can't believe that every little Jewish maiden was saying, oh God, move on me and be, let me be the one. I, that's just my personal opinion. I'm sorry, I just had to throw that in. I think it just scared her so bad she didn't know what to do. But her relationship was so pure with God. She said, I'm your handmaiden, whatever you want. Be it unto me according to your word. Now, can we say that? There are some paths that you're going to go through to get the promise God has given you that will not be pleasant. But if you will go into a trial with the right attitude, you will come out of the trial with victory and sooner than later. Thank you. Let's all say amen. Amen. I know because I've been there. I know because I've done it wrong, and I know because I've done it right. And it's so much better to do it right. And that relationship with this is what helps us do it right. It's so wonderful to know him because the Lord will astound you at things he asks you to do. Uh, I was a pastor's wife for almost 33 years when my husband died. And he encouraged me to do what I'm doing today. I turned down a position one time with a, a large ladies choir in the state we were working. And I had played the organ for them like 21 years and something happened to the director. And so the lady in charge said, would you consider doing this? I said, listen, and I was never allowed to say no coming up. We just, you know, if the Lord gives you a chance, you just walk through the door, even if it doesn't fit anything you know to do. But um, my husband was in the next room, and I said, you know, I've played for this choir for all these years, and I will do anything. I will teach parts. I will do anything you want. I will help you every way. But I don't think that I'm supposed to do that. And she said, well, I'm, I wish you would. I just feel like you should. And I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I said, well, you know, try to get somebody which was out of character for me anyway, but I thought that being in front of the choir was out of character for me. And I hung up the phone and went in the next room and my husband looked at me and said, call her back and tell her you'll do that. And I said, I don't wanna do it. I, and I was not an arguer, my sister and brother-in-law can tell you I wasn't. But I didn't think, you know, I've got all this other stuff that I do and so I went in the next room and I dialed her back and I said, uh, I'll do that. My husband told me to call you back and tell you I'll do it. <laughs> and then there was another time that I had to do something like this for a period of time, but it really wasn't like this. I mean, it was like, you know, an image, a small image of this. And then when God opened this door and 
And uh, Lyndall said, will you pray? And I said, well, yeah, I will. And I didn't pray very long. <laughs> I didn't have to pray very long before I, I knew it was the Lord's will. And God always has something else for you to do. If he closes one door, he's going to open another one, if not two or three or four, you know, if you'll walk through them. And so this is something that I had nothing to do with, but he opened this door, and now this is a promise that's being fulfilled in my life that for some reason he opened the door. But I'm getting back to the, the rough part now. It's not easy. Nothing is easy if it's worthwhile. I have got something in some notes here. I want to find it because I want to read it. I read this in a, a, a little pamphlet that an old man wrote. I mean, like he died in 1900, and I can't remember his name, but he was a minister. And he's not one of the really popular ones. And since I can't seem to find it, I'll try to tell you. Here it is. God's calling always involves blessing and suffering, joy and sadness, successes and disappointments. And uh, you can find that in Full Life Study Bible, but um, I can't remember the, the, the other piece of material I was trying to share with you. Um, we cannot, we can, we just, let's not be like um, people that go through experience and think that everything's going to be good all the time. You remember Job's family and how things begin to fall apart and fly apart, fly off die, be destroyed. And he said, do we, do we only take blessing at God's hand? Do we not have to suffer through some other stuff also? And what spoiled children we would be if everything was so comfortable all the time. Um, now, I want to, to get on uh, with Mary. When this happened, this very next verse, verse 39 says, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. This girl probably ran half the way, and it happened to be at least 60 miles. 60 miles. Do you think she went into a dark part of the house and hid away, said, oh, I'm pregnant. What in the world am I going to do? She grabbed her duds and ran. And she said, I want to check on this Elizabeth thing. Stayed there to help her three months. Probably she stayed till John was born. But anyway, now I want us just to kind of slip in on these two ladies, two, two pregnant women talking. Here's Elizabeth reproached debased because she never had a child. A blessing of the Lord was to be pregnant. She was called barren. Even the angel said, your cousin Elizabeth, the one they said is barren, she's, she's pregnant. An old woman. I wish I knew how old she was. Wouldn't it be funny? Who was the oldest lady in here that I would let me pick on her? <laughs> that, that qualifier made you sit still, didn't it? <laughs> Suppose there's an 80-year-old woman here, and then somebody in the church says, well, we're going to give Sister Sally a baby shower. And people are going, what? Well, Sister Elizabeth was quite excited, too. She, her husband was so excited he couldn't believe, and he just didn't get to talk for the rest of the time, right? I don't know what he would have said if he had been able to talk to you. <laughs> But anyway, here we are now in the room with these two women. And what happens when Mary gets there? It is so precious. Let me tell you what could have happened. The old lady could say, I'm too old to do this. I'll never be able to bear this child. Oh, God should have known I couldn't do it. And she didn't feel like that about it, did she? And she didn't say to Mary, Mary, I need to tell you these little things that'll help you. Don't hang your clothes up on the clothesline because it'll make the baby's cord get wrapped around your neck. Anybody ever hear that? And a bunch of more stuff. That's, that doesn't mean a hill of beans. But anyway, they didn't talk old wives' fables or young wives' fables. They were way too serious, way too past that. Listen what happens when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting. The baby leaped in her womb. 
And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit in a loud voice. She said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. I don't think that she even had time to tell her, do you? If she did, it didn't say it right here. Uh, blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Are these women worshiping the Lord? Are they worshiping him in their speech, in their conversation? Yes, it's all about the Lord. And not what a hard time they're having with the Lord, but how good he is. She said, what have I done to deserve the mother of our Lord to come in my home? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. The promise, right? Now, let's listen to what Mary has to say. Mary could have said a lot. Mary, if, if I had been Mary, you know, I probably would have cried all the way to uh, Judean mountains. <laughs> Because I really already got a big reputation about being a crier around here. Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. This is called the Magnificat, for those of you that might not know it. But uh, it was a song in Latin, and it was a, a worship song, but it was based on what Mary said. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. She's still going, isn't she? Just praising God. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and lifted up the humble. Now listen to this, 53. He has filled the hungry with good things. Have you, have you been hungry and the Lord filled you? And then you're hungry again and he fills you again. He fills us, he satisfies us, but it's very temporary because he has more and more and more for us. But listen to this, this is sad. He sent the rich away empty. Well, they're rich. They're empty? Yes, Lord. You sent the rich away empty because they weren't hungry for any more. Right? And what is rich to this world is not rich toward God. What is prosperous to this world is not what's prosperous to us that love him. It's more, uh, more materialistic things that satisfy people. But when people come to God and they've got this stuff, they're not hungry for God. Have you ever thought about this? When things are really going well for you, you have a hard time praying, right? Have you ever thought about this? You need to pray, you know you need to pray, and you just sat down to a great big supper, and you say, after supper, I'm gonna go pray. Okay, you eat a lot. Can you pray on that? Mm-mm. If you do, I don't know anybody else like you, because when we're full in our stomach, we think we're full in our soul. But sometimes we have to get lean everywhere so we can get a hold of God. And he said, he sent those rich people away empty. That's just cause they weren't hungry. I want God to make me so hungry for him that I will never get enough. I don't want to get enough. I, I want to just keep going and going. Mary said he's helped his servant Israel, remembered to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever even as he said to our fathers. And she stayed with Elizabeth three months and returned home. All right. After John was born, Zechariah wrote a song. He was ready to say something then, wasn't he? And he was blessing and praising God. What I want you to remember today, uh, I'm not in intercession, although I've been interceding all my life, but uh, I'm not in that group. I'm in this group, if we divide ourselves like that, Yesterday, Lila said, everybody is an intercessor. That's exactly right. Everybody's a worshiper. That's exactly right. Everybody's a warrior. That's exactly right. If you're going to make it today, you're going to have to be a warrior. An interceding, worshiping warrior. 
And if we, uh, if we want to go a little farther with this, it wasn't immediate, but you know that Mary had to, to take some really hard jolts in life with women whispering behind her back. And you know the cruel things that people can say. Some people don't want you to hear it, and some people want you to hear it. They act like they don't want you to hear it, but they're hoping you do because they want to hurt your feelings, right? There are people like that. They're not all outside the church either. Um, well, we won't go there today. I haven't got time. Mike's already getting over here, getting ready. Uh, I want to talk to you about the trip. What a trip. Your promise is going to be a trip for you. I don't know what your promise is. I'm going to mention that to you in a minute, but I'm talking to you about her promise right now. In her womb was the salvation of the world, the healer of our bodies, our soon coming king, our comfort, everything we need. She was carrying it. It was not easy. Why do things happen at inconvenient times? Uh, I, not only was a pastor's wife, I have four sons and one daughter, and all of them and their families are in ministry today. So I'm telling you, I know about the trip. It didn't happen like that, it, you know. But anyway, God, it, God is on the throne. He answers the prayers, and he answers them a lot faster and a lot better when we worship our way right on through. Um, on this trip, she rode a donkey. And I just feel in my mind like sometime along that trip, she might have just got a little bit irritated. Pregnant women usually get a little bit irritated sometime in that nine months. But men get irritated too, so, you know. She probably said something like, Joseph, let me walk. I can't ride one more mile on the backbone of this donkey. And if she was like some pregnant women, she might not have called him a donkey. She might have called him that other biblical <laughs> name that he's called sometimes because that was not comfortable. Can you imagine having to ride just before your baby's born a number of miles to the hospital? This, this is a timely message, I'll tell you why. I, my daughter's expecting her third child last Friday and I caught, called her a few minutes ago and she said, well, if I don't go today, they're gonna take me in the morning. So she's an hour from the hospital. But I'm not nervous because Val prayed all that off of me a while ago. But I said, oh, how timely this message is, pregnant with a promise. So here she is up on this donkey with the baby in her womb and Joseph walking by her side being so supportive and so obedient to the Lord. We just don't have time to talk about goodness of Joseph today, but there are people that come alongside to support us that are just as important in, us, as in our answer as anybody else, even as ourselves. But um, she was not having a good trip. It was not convenient for them to have to go there and be taxed. Uh, she wasn't evidently prepared. She evidently didn't take a lot of stuff with her because the baby ended up lying in a manger, which was a feeding trough. And one of the times I went to Israel, I saw a manger, and it was not made out of wood. You know, like the little slats we always pull out and put straw in for Christmas programs. That's not really a manger, folks. That's just something we made to look like an animal could eat out of it. But they didn't have a lot of trees. Remember, back in those days, until people started irrigating and God said the desert would blossom like a rose, it wasn't too pretty. <clears throat> the old, old pictures that you have of Israel in your Bible, if you've got an old Bible, <clears throat> that was pretty much what it looked like. So they didn't have a lot of trees to spare, and they would hollow out stone. And when this man said, that's a manger, folks, I thought, oh, my goodness, that puts a little different light on it. Well, there he was, and not a pretty little blanket, not a soft, downy, washed blanket. No, just the old rags that they used for the cows. And that's what the Bible said, swaddling clothes. So I don't think that was something she packed up and took with her. It was not a convenient time. There's a, 
a little humorous thing that happened in my life about 25 years ago. My children were small, and we tried our best to spend the, the right time with them. We planned a little camping trip about 20 miles away. You know, it's a big deal. Big deal for little boys and a little girl. And so some member died. So we said, guys, we're going to have to postpone our trip, like Friday night and Saturday. And one of the little boys is about eight, and he almost cried. He said, Daddy, why couldn't he die at a more convenient time? It's like, and so then I just took over. I said, John, there's not a convenient time. You just might as well learn that today. There's never a convenient time. And some of your trip, getting your promise, is not going to be convenient. But just keep on. Praise your way through the inconveniences. Here's the reference I wanted to tell you a little bit ago. A wise man refuses to accuse God of any wrongdoing in adversity. The first thing that happens to us usually in adversity, we rail out at somebody, usually the people we love the most. But a wise man will never rail out at God like that because God's not responsible for us being hurt. He's responsible for us getting better. And if it takes a little trimming and this and that, he will allow us to go through those fires. This precious little Mary, she just counted it worth it. Uh, counted it a great privilege to share his reproach. I talked about her reproach, but now she's, she's really concerned about this baby she's carrying, and she was so humble. She was glad to bear his reproach. Uh, I want to talk to you just a second about the shame. How many of you have been through a trial? Well, you may be going through it today, and it's been a really a uh, heavy load of shame to you. Would, okay, raise your hands. Me too. I've been there. And you don't have to reflect on what it is. It's just that some of our trials are embarrassing. Our ears burn. We feel like everybody that's whispering is talking about me and my stuff. We feel like, you know, that they know all of the private stuff that we don't want anybody to know. And occasionally, I will tell you, if it hadn't happened to you already, if anybody can get a hold of anything that makes you feel bad, they won't let it be private. They'll be sure that other people need to know the news so they'll know how to pray for you. Isn't that ironic? Well, okay. There's shame. There's shame in carrying your burden till your promise is fulfilled. You know what Jesus... Uh, when he went to the synagogue and they gave him the scroll and he read, it's Luke 4, but it was really uh, Isaiah 61. And when he finished this about the gospels preached to the poor, bind up the captive, brokenhearted, all of that. And then he said, he closed it and said, today, and he rolled it up, he said, today is fulfilled in your ears. Well, if you go to that same book, chapter 61 of Isaiah, and you read a little bit farther, I want you to listen to what else he said. And she knew this scripture because it was Old Testament, and that's what she had. Instead, I'm starting in verse 7. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. And I just wonder, I don't know, I just wonder if she didn't come across that sometime in this nine months. Because you know she was ashamed. She had to be ashamed, because that would have been normal. But um, this scripture came alive to me at a point in my life when... Uh, Things seemed to be falling apart with my oldest son and his family. And we went to a conference in California. And the, this particular sermon, I, I bet there were 3,000 people in the building. And I was way back there. And I felt like every word he said was to me, like nobody else was there. Because I was going through real shame. And it was not anything that I did. But it was stuff that was happening in my son's life 
the, the devil will zero in on you and he will say, it's your fault. Everybody knows it's your fault. Just think now. If you'll think enough, you can figure what you did wrong to get here. You're to blame. All those members, they're paying tithes. They're paying your husband's salary. But they're back there talking about how you did wrong or this never would have happened. I'm telling you the truth. Are any of you relating to what I'm saying? And then this preacher said, the shame, the shame goes back to the devil. Jesus bore the shame on the cross. He took our shame. It's not our shame anymore. And it goes back to the devil and we get double. We get to rejoice in our own land that the devil tried to steal away from him. I love to rejoice in the Lord. I, I love to rejoice in him even when I'm not feeling good. And uh, sometimes I don't feel good. These kids, <laughs> these kids tease me about how old I am. <laughs> that should give anybody here hope, right? If you can change careers after you're considered a senior citizen, which I'm not, I don't, I just now started getting my discount at restaurants, and it's like. <laughs> but anyway, these kids, I, I love them. I just love where I am. I, I love where I'm in the Lord, but I love where I am in the Lord too. A couple weeks ago, uh, they, I said, "Wait a minute, I am 58 years old." So I went in the office and dressed and came back out for church. They said, "Oh, you look like you're going to be in the Sound of Music." He didn't, oh, well, no, that was Greg, the, the tall, skinny one that plays the organ. He came out, he said, uh, Miss Judy, tell me how it was during the Depression. I said, I don't know. My grandma's dead, but you could have asked her about it. But you know something? When God gives you a promise, you can just keep on trucking. It's better than Timex. Keep ticking. Just keep going. I, lo I love knowing God. I just love it. And you know why. That's the secret. Every day. If you eat every day, you read every day, right? Okay, so she went through this shame. But the very son that she was bearing that would get up and say, this word is fulfilled in your ears today. That just that same chapter says, I'll take your shame and I'll give you double in your own land. And I know that she, she accepted everything the Lord gave her. And then it even says, I will rejoice in what you're going to do. Now, I want to talk to you just a second because I know Mike's dying to get up here and give me a little retaliation here. Um, I want to talk to you about some things that could be your promise. Maybe you're saying, I don't know, she's not talking to me, I don't have a promise. Well, now you probably do. If you've got any children, or you expect to have any children, Isaiah, 40, Isaiah 54 and 13 says, and all thy children shall be taught of me. This goes for grandchildren too. Hold on to it because you need it for the salvation of your family, your seed. Maybe you're just needing a physical healing or an emotional healing, which can be just as bad. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says, Surely he has borne our transgressions. He has carried our sorrows. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And with his stripes... We are healed. There's a promise. Uh, Matthew 6 talks about praying in secret. And it uses that word secret three times, just right together. If you'll pray in secret, he will answer you openly. Okay? There's another promise. Uh, I can remember as a very small child, my dad was an on-fire pioneer preacher, and he's still on fire. He's just 80 years old, so he can't move, can't move around. It's like, where are you rushing off to, Dad? It's like, <laughs> we love him, but uh, 
He kept us on the firing line, if not one way, another. But I remember as a small child, when we would have family prayer, I remember him laying his hands on me and saying, God, make her a soul winner. Make her a soul winner. And you know what? When I was a little old bitty girl and go to school, the Lord would show me my little friends that needed the Lord. And I remember winning one of my little friends to the Lord in the cloakroom one day. In those old-timey schools, you went in, and then in the back of the room, there were two doors. Went in this way, and you hung your coats on the little rack or a little nail or something and back, you know. So we just kind of made our way back to the cloakroom during recess, and she got saved. <laughs> And see, that was my daddy's prayer. And we all need to be soul winners. And here's a promise. He that winneth souls is wise. Proverbs 11 and 30. And here's another one that goes with it. Daniel 12 and 3 says, They that be wise shall shine as the stars and turn many to righteousness. It all ties in together. I don't want to do it for the shine, and I just want to do it because I want to have something to tell him when I get there, I did this for you. I worshiped before people for you. And all of you, since you're worshipers, know John 4, 23 and 24, that the day will come, and now is that men will worship him in spirit and in truth. Sometimes we have... A little problem with her peace. Uh, a mother was telling me the other day that she experienced this with one of her children and one of my boys, who is a very successful pastor now, had a really <laughs> precious. Thank you, thank you. This uh, little boy, about 13, had such a difficult time sleeping, and I don't know what it was. I just I never could get an answer. You know why he can't go to sleep? His daddy made him memorize John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Peace I leave with you. And he said, Matt, when this happens, you just, just quote it. Just quote it till you go to sleep. And I was sitting in his congregation a couple years ago, and he was preaching. And he said, my mom probably doesn't know this, but I remember trying to go to sleep and facing things. And I knew she was spread out in the hallway at my door praying for me. And I was praying quietly because I didn't want to wake him up. But he knew that and he remembered that. So what you do with your children will go on. It will go on and on and on and it'll go into eternity. And on the other hand, what you don't do with them will go on too. We have promises that we need the fruit of the Spirit, and He will help us. We have the promise that I gave you to start with in Psalm 37 and 4, that if you will delight yourself in the Lord, He will do what? Give you the desires of your heart. I don't know what your promise is today. I don't know what your purpose is. But the Lord does because He has something for all of us to do. But I want to just give you this one word of advice. You just keep on. If you stumble, you just keep on stumbling. If you fall, you just keep on fall and get back up. If you have to go through shame and your ears burn with embarrassment when you know people are talking behind your back about what you're going through, if you know that people are ridiculing you and all you're doing is just trying to live close to God and please Him, you just keep pushing right on through because you're pregnant with a promise from God. And if you will worship him with joy, did you know that you really can have joy in a hard time? And it amazes the world. The Bible speaks about the joy that passes all understanding. Even in my husband's death, I had the joy of the Lord. And I know this very minute, I know I've got friends that thought, that I was in the state of shock at his funeral because we came in and we sang and we praised God. 
and we walked back out, and I didn't have any medication. I had the Holy Ghost. And I had been awake for one whole week, except for just, just moments of napping until uh, the night before he died, and my sons made me think they were going to whip me if I didn't go get in the bed. But I was on my feet all of that time. But I felt the Lord, the Lord's presence. The joy of the Lord is our strength, even when things are happening we don't agree with and we don't want to happen. But if it's God's time and it's God's will, he will help us and he will give us that strength that we need to make it through. So you just keep on because the Bible says you will reap if you faint not. Don't faint. Let's stand up and praise the Lord well. Praise you today, Lord, for the great privilege of being in your house. Praise you for this cloud of witnesses that stand in the Brownsville Assembly of God this morning, Lord. I praise you, Lord, because we've shared your word, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, because you are so true to your word. You cannot lie. You're not a man that you would lie, God. You always tell us the truth, and you always stand by us no matter what other people around us, family, friends, associates would do. You will stand with us, Lord. And I thank you because that you will help us to be fulfilled with the promise that you give us to carry in this life. It will be worthwhile. It will be worth everything to know that we've done your will. And we praise you. Thank you because we can worship you in adversity. Thank you because we can worship you when things don't go well. We can be like Job and say, when I'm tried, I will come forth as pure gold. I will. I will come forth as pure gold. Because we worship you, dear Lord Jesus. We worship you. We praise you. We glorify your name. We thank you, God, because the lines have fallen to us in pleasant places. We thank you, Lord. We bless you with all of our heart today. We praise you for the privilege to be called by your name, oh, Lord Jesus. I'm so unworthy that anybody would think I was a Christian, Lord. You're so wonderful, so holy, without any flaw, and yet we call ourselves by your name, Lord Jesus. Let us be more like you. Mold us and make us after your will, Lord Jesus. Help us to spend time before you, not only reading your word, but listening to your voice, dear God. Your word will make us strong. Your spirit will make us powerful. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness this day and for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.